Welcome to John Gets Games. This is my variety vlog for June 2016 where I'm going to cover a variety of subjects pertaining to the stuff that's happened over the last month. So feel free to skip ahead to the section you're most interested in or stick around for the whole thing. As far as general updates go, June has been a very big month for the channel and that's because I spent a bunch of money and I upgraded my video rig for the channel. Now, uh, a big part of this came from the support that Patreon backers have been giving me over the last year. I really appreciate that. You guys have allowed me to make some shirts and then also subsidize the cost of this because you may or may not know this, but I started this channel by just holding an iPhone 5 kind of shakily over some games, and then I got an iPhone 6 and I bought this boom arm thing. And what I ended up doing is I put the iPhone 6 into a case and then I nailed that case into this rubber pad which allows me to spin this around and do all of the video that I've done for the last year and a half. It's been right through here. And so for the first time, I'm actually recording this with a very nice video camera. It's got all sorts of bells and whistles that I don't fully understand and I'm starting to learn how to be a much better at videography, vid videography as far as exposure goes and oh man, there's all sorts of things going on there. But I also bought a microscope mount that kind of articulates out and it allows me to, well see this arm right here allowed me to get over the table and kind of get directly over the action and your average tripod doesn't let you do that. You kind of have to go at an angle but now I got this this arm that my dad helped me kind of attach together because my dad's a mechanical engineer and he's retired, that definitely helped. So we've got that all built and I've now recorded several videos with it over the last month and I'm just really excited to see where this goes in the future. I am planning on recording a full playthrough of Scythe tomorrow and I hope to get that out uh, in this week as well, if not this week, then next week. And it's gonna be so much better with this new articulating arm situation because I can zoom in and zoom out because spoiler alert, you can't really zoom in on these things. So it was very, clunky to try and get the different camera angles that I've done. I'm really expecting this to lower the amount of time that this all takes and just kind of make it more fun in general, which is the whole idea of this channel. So um, yeah, and as I mentioned before, I really appreciate the support that Patreon backers have been giving me. If you enjoy the content that I've been putting out and you want to help me continue to make it better in incremental ways, sometimes big ones like dropping a bunch of money on a new camera or small ones, I would really appreciate your support. For Q&A in the month of June, I received one question and that came from Mark Johnson. And he asked, in your last vlog, you mentioned that it's getting hard to cut games because you have a good collection. Do you find there is diminishing returns on the effort to learn, teach games, and money to buy games as your collection grows? And I think you could look at it that way because if you have a small collection and you add a great new game to it, in general, your collection is going to be much better because of that. But if you have a big collection of well over 100 games like I do, adding a new game is going to have a less of an impact in the general scope of your collection. But I don't like to think about it that way because this is a very subjective type of question. I get tons of enjoyment from playing new games, from reading new rules, from seeing new mechanics, and also seeing how old mechanics mesh together in new interesting ways. Other people I know really enjoy delving deep down into a game. They'll play Pandemic like 50 times, and I'm just not that person. Even if a game is really replayable for me and I'm very excited to play it, it's still going to be a long time until that game breaks, even 10 plays, because I like playing new games, and those games that I really like well, I still have very fond memories of them. I have lots of good things to say about them, and I say that I want to get them out um, again and again, but, well, new games come in. I want to play those new games. And so for now, for me, I don't feel like there's diminishing returns because there's kind of like I'm keeping pace with the industry as new games are coming in. And also, just so you know, I've been this guy for a long time, long before I started recording myself and putting it up on YouTube. I have been the person who gets all the new games because I just really enjoy them, and now I happen to have proof to show just how much my uh, collection changes because I'm recording it. So it's, it's really hard to answer this question. For me, no, I don't think so. For you, that might be the case because you, uh, you really like your collection. You love the six or eight or 50 games. I don't know what you have. And if you get tons of enjoyment from playing them over and over and over again, then sure, getting that extra new game is not going to affect it as much as me where I just get really excited when I get a new game and the number one thing I want to do is just play that new game. If you have any questions that you'd like me to answer on next month's vlog, please feel free to email it over to me at johngetsgames at gmail.com or just throw it into a comment on this video and I'll answer it next time. Now let's talk about a game that is getting me excited and for this month that will be Cry Havoc. Now at first glance this does not look like my kind of game. You have a map and you got a bunch of miniatures on it. It looks kind of like dudes on a map war game but there are a lot of Euroy things going on here that kind of make it a hybrid and that definitely has me intrigued. Uh, the first thing is that this is a victory point race game. There is a bit of area majority uh, and control that you're trying to do with the various stuff on the board and you are going to be doing some battles with a very cool combat resolution mechanic they'll talk about in a second. But 
at its core, this is a multi-use card game where you draw up a hand of cards and the cards can do all sorts of things. It might let you move your units around on the board, or it might let you build a building, or maybe it lets you activate some special text on the bottom that does something cool for you either right now or maybe in combat. There's all sorts of ways that you can evaluate this hand of cards that you're going to have in front of you. And on top of that, it has a little bit of deck building because you can um, draw from your main deck, which is uh, has a variety of different stuff in it, but then there are also four kind of more combat-oriented decks for the four different types of terrain on the board. And you know that if I draw this card, it's going to be very good for fighting in the mountains, and I know that I'm going to be fighting in the mountains. And so you draw that in your hand, and now you can use it, and it goes into your discard, and then you can keep using it, so maybe you're more incentivized to fight in the mountains as you go on in the game. And at the end of the day, like I said, you are just trying to get victory points. So it's like this kind of war game with a euro ribbon wrapped around the top, and I'm very intrigued to see how it plays out. The combat mechanism is completely randomness, which is also interesting. You're not throwing dice or anything like that, or and it's also not like a simultaneous reveal, which isn't random but sometimes feels like it. In this game, you are going to associate your units with three different types of battle. You either want to take control over the region, which is just going to get your victory points, or maybe you want to take prisoners of war, so you take their units and you put them into your area and you generate points for that. And also, your opponent doesn't have access to that unit. There's a finite number of units you can put out on the board, so they have to pay victory points to take it back from you, so that's a little bit of a one-two punch. Or you could just put the units down in a spot to just do annihilation, just destroy as many of your opponent's units as you can to maybe... Um, just wipe them out this turn and not get any points, but then come in on the next turn and then try to do more damage when they're much weaker. And then what you do is you're going to be playing cards back and forth. I play a card, you play a card. I play a card, you play a card. That might move the units around these different combat boards. And then you just look at who has the most for the uh, territory control. The, for the prisoners ones, you just kind of take the prisoners. For the attrition, you just kind of pop the guys off. It looks very simple and very oriented around hand management, which I love. I love hand management, and I especially love it when you can modify your hand management with the cards that you pull into your deck. So um, I, I don't know if I am going to love this game, but I can say that I am excited about it. It's got some stuff that I really like in games, has some stuff that I'm not usually crazy about, but like I said earlier in this vlog, I love seeing how different mechanics mesh together in new and interesting ways, and this one definitely has it. Also, on top of all that, it's got significantly asymmetric factions, where if you're playing in a three-player game, one of the factions is just uh, kind of an NPC. It's like the natives on this planet that you're trying to exploit. Or you can play four players and everybody's going at it and uh, one person has more things and uh, like more units on the board. Another person is able to make lots of buildings because they are sentient machines. There's just a lot of theme and amazing art. Like, if you haven't seen the card art in this, I, I don't know how they were able to budget for this much really cool-looking sci-fi art. So... That kind of wraps it up. I'm quite excited for this game. I believe I'm going to be getting a review copy of the game, so I hope to be able to try it pretty soon, and I will be sure to let you guys know what I think about it. It's now time to move into the Games of Note section, and I'm going to talk about seven different games. These are either games that I played for the first time in this last month, or for one reason or another, I really want to talk about that specific play. And we're going to begin with Pandemic Legacy, and that's because we finished it. Jessica and I were able to complete the campaign uh, with uh, an evening early in June where we finished the last two gameplays. It was December. We lost it in the first half of the month of December. And wow, what an amazing experience all the way through. It took us 18 games total, and... That's as spoilery as I'm going to get as far as talking about the game because it just, it, it's so wonderful. The things that get revealed, the story arcs, and just, it was one of the better board gaming experiences that I've really ever had, and specifically with playing with my wife. It was an excellent two-player experience. I've talked about that many times, so I'm not going to go into it uh, more and more. We did play it with four characters the whole way through, and I, I strongly recommend it still. It, uh, it's still on my shelf uh, back behind me right over there. I'm not really sure why because for us, after 18 games, we're kind of done with it. I don't think we're going to try and keep playing it in its modified state, but I don't really want to get rid of it yet. Like, it's kind of, I enjoy seeing it on the shelf. It's a lingering, uh, nice glow of a really great gaming experience. And, you know, 18 games is a lot more than most games on my shelf ever even get. So, uh, what a great experience, and I'm really happy that we were able to finish it. Next up is 13 Days, which I was able to play at Victory Point Cafe, which is in downtown Berkeley. And I was really happy when they got a copy because I've been very interested in trying this game, but not quite enough to actually buy it. And that's because this is kind of built to be Twilight Struggle Lite. And I did not ultimately like Twilight Struggle that much. I owned it and I played it a few times and sold it because it turned me into the kind of gamer that I don't like. I whined a lot, like, oh, my hand of cards is so terrible, and I roll the die, and oh, of course I rolled a two, and oh, I lose every die roll, and man, I find that annoying in other people, but when you see yourself doing that, you really gotta put the brakes on it and either 
fix it or just not play those kinds of games. So that was my fix for that. But it has some really great ideas, what Twilight Struggle did, and 13 Days has many of those really good ideas in a very condensed form because Twilight Struggle could last multiple hours and has a bunch of area control and just a bunch of stuff going on. In this game, it's condensed down to just, I think, nine different regions, and you have a little bit of area majority control going on, but realistically, it's all about a hand management system where you have a deck of cards that has some cards that are good for the USA, which is what one player will be playing. Uh, there's some cards that are good for the USSR, which is the other player, and then some neutral UN cards. And you shuffle that up and you draw randomly from that stack, and so you might draw cards for your opponent. You might draw like a whole hand of your opponent's cards. And when you play those cards, it helps your opponent, which is a bummer, like you definitely don't want to do that, but it forces you to play those cards in such a way that your opponent will get the least amount of benefit from them, and there is a lot of game there, and I really enjoy the idea of that. It can be a bit stressful, and it is one of the things that turned me off to Twilight Struggle, but Twilight Struggle was multiple hours, and this game is like 40 minute experience, and I ended up playing it twice, back to back, first time as USSR, second time as the USA, and um, the first game was like 30 minutes, the second game was like 15 minutes, because in both those games, I caused nuclear war. <laughs> I lost both uh, from both sides of the, the aisle, I guess. So I can't really blame the asymmetry at all. I think I'm just not very good at keeping the world stable. <laughs> I think thematically that makes a lot of sense. Like, as you have a Cold War and you're escalating military and escalating political ramifications, it'd be pretty easy to drop a ball somewhere and have this cascading effect that wipes everything out. And I guess in the real world, if there's nuclear war, everybody loses. But in this game, if you cause it, if you're the first person to shoot that nuke, um, well, you're the only one who loses, and I did that twice, and I had fun. It was a good time. I played with Areg, who's one of the two owners of uh, Victory, uh, Victory Point Game, uh, Victory Point Cafe, and uh, we had a good time, but I don't see myself buying this game because it, it still is a bit stressful, uh, and it's not the kind of game I see myself wanting to play all the time. I definitely uh, will look forward to playing this game at the cafe again because I have some friends who really enjoy Twilight Struggle, and I want to introduce it to them. And it is a cool game experience, but just not quite one that's going to cause me to buy a copy for myself. The third game of note is Thunder and Lightning, which I actually played right after 13 Days at Victory Point Cafe with Areg. And just like 13 Days, uh, we played it twice and I lost both games. And what's going on in this game is it's a card game that is a redo of an older game called Hera and Zeus. And in this game, you are playing as uh, Loki versus, I think it was Thor, yeah. And what you're doing is you have these different lines of battle. You're putting cards down, and they, uh, I put my cards like this, my opponent puts their cards like this, and it has a Stratego vibe to it because when you play cards down, you put them face down, so you don't know what value it's going to be. It might be like a Strength 3 or a Strength 4, and uh, your opponent has that too, and you can cause these cards to attack each other. You say, okay, I cause this card to attack that one because they're in line in this uh, battle space, you both flip over your cards, the one with a higher value wins, and you discard the other one. If it's a tie, you discard the both, and then any cards that were behind it kind of scoot forward, um, maintaining the ranks. And it's just a push and pull kind of game where you're drawing cards from your deck and you're playing these cards down, but there is an interesting thing going on here where the number of actions that you get on a turn is equal to the number of, I guess, columns that you have deployed out in front of you. And what can happen, and what did happen in both these games, is we had a really good um, contention going on. Like, one person gets a little bit of head, the other person goes back, back and forth, and then one person had a really decisive victory and wiped out multiple rows. And at that point, one person, me, in both of these cases, had like maybe one, I'm sorry, column left over, and my opponent had like three columns. And so every turn I was taking a single action, and then my opponent would take three actions. And then I would take a single action, and then my opponent would take three actions. And I found my, and one of the actions in this game is just drawing cards. So if I had a bad hand of cards, like a bunch of level one value cards, which are ravens in this game, which is what tended to happen because there's a lot of these in the deck, well, you put a raven down face down and then your opponent starts their turn and they say, well, I attack. You flip it over, they win, and now you're back down to zero columns. And it was really obvious that there was a humongous runaway leader issue with this game. And I think it just should have had a different end game condition or something like that decisive victory should have just ended it instead of kind of having this slow lull as you kind of continue to obviously win for an extra 10 minutes that's not fun for either side. It's, there was no contention anymore. Like when one person's taking three actions to the other, uh, your opponent taking one, you have to get astonishingly lucky to pull back from that. And in general, I think the idea of having the number of actions you take on a turn be equal to the number of columns you have, I think that's kind of neat. But in execution, I didn't really like it because the fun of this game was the, oh, what is that card? Are they bluffing? Is it going to be the one card that can beat my one specific troop? 
the fun was not in action management, especially considering once one person got smacked down, they just could not get back up. I much rather would just always get three actions and just play the game that way and feel that it was um, a longer term card play mechanism that made one person win or not. So I really wanted to love this game. It has astonishing art. Uh, but after two plays, I don't know if I'm going to play it again. I, I might, uh, but it, it seemed to have a really annoying problem there. It, it had an end game problem. Like the beginning of the game was fun. The middle of the game was fun. The end of the game was really not fun for both of us. And I'm pretty surprised by it. Considering it's a redo of an older game, you'd think that that kind of thing wouldn't pop up. And maybe it's just me. And maybe we just had weird plays of it. But that's what happened to us twice. Space Team, the card game, is the next one that I'm going to cover. This is not the kind of game that I generally would gravitate towards. And in fact, I don't own this game. It was uh, kickstarted by a good friend of mine who lives in San Diego. Twice a year, I uh, do a nine-hour drive down there to hang out with them for a long weekend, play a bunch of games, and reconnect. They're a bunch of my college friends. And uh, he's like, hey, I have this game called Space Team. Let's give it a shot. And we had eight players. And it was a surprisingly fun time because – I say surprising because – when I first heard about it, oh, it's a frantic real-time game where you're just drawing cards and yelling at each other. Well, in general, I don't like that kind of game, but we had a really good time here. I think that eight players was too much. If we had six players, it would have been even better. But what's going on here is you just, uh, I guess your, your spacecraft is falling apart or it's about to fall into a black hole or something. And it's fully cooperative, which I enjoy. It's real-time, which in general I don't enjoy as much, but the cooperativeness makes it a little bit better. And in general, I think the games we played were only five minutes long, so very small uh, time frames. And what you're doing is you randomize this deck of mishaps that happen to your ship and then you deal them out to all the players. And inside those decks are the fixed cards and you're trying to have everybody get through these decks of mishaps personally in order to reveal all the fixed cards and then you win when you get the six out that uh, form a nice picture of your completed spaceship. And what you're doing here is each card just says you need this one specific card to fix this or you need this one specific icon. And everybody's doing this simultaneously. So people are yelling across the table like, I need a cosmic diffuser. I need something that has a star on it. Just please give me two things that have this. And just everybody's yelling back and forth. And then there's these special event cards that come up that say, everybody stand up and move one to the right. Or everybody pass your hand of cards to the left. Or you can't talk until somebody yells your name. So, so you draw this, you can't talk, and you start shoving it in front of everybody's faces. And it was a frantic fun time. Uh, like I said, eight players is a bit too much. It was very loud, and we did not win either of the games. Although the second one... We got pretty close, and I had a good time. Uh, next time I'm down there, I hope we have about six players and we can play it again and see if we can win on it. It was it was a good time. It's a uh, adaptation of an iOS game that was really similar, where everybody had the game on their iPhone or Android probably, and they were screaming at each other to touch different parts of each other's phones. It's just a chaotic, um, surprisingly fun time, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say about that. Next up, we have Sigil, which is an elegant, beautiful little card game, which has seven suits of seven cards in it, as well as seven of each special spirit cards. And what you do is you shuffle this up, and then you put it out on the table in one of a variety of different patterns that uh, kind of locks the cards on top of each other. You're layering them on top of each other, kind of like Seven Wonders Duel, and I believe Mahjong, where half of the cards in these rows are going to be face down, and the other half are face up. And what you're trying to do is just capture these seven spirits that are associated with a number and a suit. Um, each spirit is associated with one of those two. And what you do in your turn is really simple. You just take a card and put it in your hand. And the only cards you can grab are the ones on the outside that don't have any cards that are currently overlapped on top of it. And you're trying to make sets. If you have three of a number that matches the number of a spirit, then you can play that and take that spirit. But it's important to note that these spirits are also randomly shuffled up into this sigil pattern on the board. So once they are revealed, uh, when you flip the card up, or there's nothing on top of it, it gets freed and it gets put off to the side of the board. And then people can jump over there and grab it with a set of three. But once you take a spirit and put it in front of you, you leave those three cards in front of you as well. And an opponent can grab it from you if they play a set of four of either the correct number or the correct suit. So that can go back in front of them. And you keep going until one player has a certain number of these spirits or you draw all the cards in the uh, middle of the table and whoever's the most spirits is going to win the game. And I've really enjoyed it. I played it a couple times, once at two player and once I believe at four player. And it was pretty neat. There was a surprising number of things to think about, uh, really paying attention to what cards your opponents were taking to see what they were kind of angling to do. Like maybe they're trying to angling to take one of your spirits and maybe you counter draft cards away from them so they won't be able to have enough to take it from you, but maybe they're trying to do something else. There's quite a bit of uh, thinking and counter thinking in a very simple rule set and a beautiful looking game. Uh, so yeah, I've enjoyed playing it so far. My uh, ultimate opinion of it is a bit uh, out at the moment, but it's been a good experience and I look forward to trying it some more times. 
Dodeca is the sixth game that I'm going to cover, and it came out a couple years ago. It's been on my wish list since I first heard about it in about 2014, and I believe it just got re-released under the name Dow. But this is also a very light, simple card game, but this is a push-your-luck style game where there are five different suits in the deck, and they, the numbers on these suits vary from zero to four. And what you do is you just um, you uh, reveal them in a row in front of the deck, and you add up all the numbers, and if you ever, on your turn, uh, reveal a card such that you go over 12, then you take all the cards and put them into your hand. And that's not necessarily a good thing. So on your turn, you're either going to flip over a card, which is pushing your luck, or you can take into your hand the oldest card, which is the one that is closest to the deck. And sometimes that's going to be a card you really want because scoring is really simple. At the end of the game, you look at your hand with a whole bunch of cards in it, potentially, and you decide which one of the five suits you're going to score positive points for, and you add up the numerical value on those cards. And then every other suit is worth minus one point per card. So you get positive points for this one suit, and then each card is worth minus one, and then whoever has the most points wins. And in the game so far, the first game was a winning score of three. The second game, I think, was a winning score of six. I got kind of lucky there. So it might be your turn, and the card that is right next to the deck might be the one that works for the suit they have the most of, and then lucky you, you take that, it's a no-brainer. More often than not, it's a card that may or may not be good for you, and you need to decide, is it worth taking that minus one point, or do you push your luck to flip over a card to see if you draw the right one, because it could be a zero, and if it was already at 12, then you'd be fine. Also, if you flip over a card that's the same number as the last card in the line, even if you go way over 12, you're also safe. So it's just this fun little push your luck experience where everybody's either taking a card or flipping over a card, which has sort of a Colorado vibe when you think about it, but it also has a parade vibe because you're counting up all these numbers in front of you, and it, it's a little bit easier to score than parade, and it's a little bit easier to see what the current positioning is um, as far as the grabbing rules. So. I, this is not a glowing recommendation, but I've enjoyed playing it a couple times. It's so quick to teach, like definitely way under a minute, that I could see this one coming out somewhat often as a beginning of the night or right in the middle of games filler type game. The last game I know I'll be covering is Garbage Day, which was sent to me by Mayday Games, and I just got to show you the box that this game comes in. It's literally a garbage can, shiny, and it has a locking lid you have to spin to take off. And this is actually a game component. You put the lid back on top, and this is a dexterity game where you are piling garbage on top of this garbage can, and it's going to go kind of farther and farther out because each of these cards has two little holes on it, and when you put a card down on top of the garbage, you have to be able to see through the holes to the table. So it's going to get wider and wider and wider until it all collapses. So it has that fun dexterity element of like, oh, is it going to collapse? Is it going to collapse? And then it doesn't. And you're like, what? Or, you know, something happens and uh, they put a card down and you think they're fine and then suddenly it all falls down. And when it falls, like it, it's a cascade of cards that all fall down. It's humongous clumps. And it's thematically fun because each of these cards has like gross or weird things that you'd be putting in the garbage. So you're like, you know, oh, gross. You put that in your room because that's the other thing that you're doing in this game. You're either putting cards down onto the garbage can or you're putting them into your room which is a bit of a stall tactic because once you have a certain number of uh, types of cards uh, value in your room, you have to take all the cards in your room and put them into the trash. Like, I guess your room is full. And that is really gross. Like, oh my god, you have that stuff in your room? Disgusting. And uh, so the moment when uh, all the cards fall down is a lot of fun. But I found that the game seemed to go on a bit long because the idea of the game is you just go until one person is left standing uh, because everybody else has caused all the cards to fall off. And the way it seemed to work is we were building up, building up, building up, and then it would fall. And then there'd be like 10 more minutes of building up, building up, and then it would fall. And then like five or eight more minutes, and then it just, the game went on a little too long. It felt like it should have been maybe designed for more of a 15-minute experience, and maybe we were just being too cautious with how we were building the garbage can. And the next time I play, instead of being cautious, I'm probably going to put the cards out as far as I can right from the very get-go to kind of cause those fun, collapsing moments to happen faster. Uh, and I do see myself playing this game again. Uh, I don't think it's going to come out all the time, but it was it was pretty fun. Also, I didn't mention it. There's a bunch of Take That cards in here, which in general I really don't like in games. But for a game called Garbage Day, where you're uh, a bunch of roommates putting off taking out the garbage, it seems to make sense. So you can like cause an intervention with your friend, and now they have to take everything out of the room because it's just gross. And uh, yeah, there's, there's some fun stuff in here. I was a little surprised. Uh, when I first got and saw it, I was like, oh, this... I'm not so sure about this, but we laughed quite a bit when we played it. I ended up winning, which I guess helps in that one play-in. I see us playing this again at some point in the future. 
The final segment for this variety vlog is on and off the shelf, and this was a pretty light month for me. I only acquired two games. One was Garbage Day, which I talked about already, and the other one was Merms, which is right behind me over there. And this is a game that I've been interested in for years. When it first came out, I threw out my wish list, but it was never quite enough to actually go out and spend money on. And then somebody on Board Game Geek offered a trade for Akrotiri for the game. So I decided I wasn't really playing Akrotiri, so I want to try Merms, so I did it. So I sent it off and I got this game back. And because of that, well, I think because I did a trade and also because I was able to jig around my collection, I did not have to take anything off the wall in order to make room for it. So uh, this month, there's nothing coming off the shelf. There's just those two things coming on. And spoiler alert, next month, uh, I'll be getting quite a few games. <laughs> I can already tell it's not going to be a two-game acquisition month at all, but um, I'll look forward to talking about those on the next vlog. So that about wraps up this variety vlog. Again, if you have any questions you'd like me to answer on the next vlog, please email them over to johngetsgames at gmail.com. And also, uh, please consider supporting this channel on Patreon. I put a lot into this uh, channel, into these videos. I love doing them. I love upgrading and getting the stuff to uh, make the overall channel better. And I really appreciate all the support that I've got on there. And I uh, would definitely appreciate your support in the future. Uh, if you like these kind of vlogs and you also like in-depth board game reviews and full game playthroughs, please also subscribe to my channel. I'd really appreciate it. And I really hope you enjoyed watching this video.